Hello and welcome to the National Cybersecurity Studio Association webcast series. My name is Gustavo Hinojosa, uh, Executive Director of the National Cybersecurity Studio Association. Today we have John McGill, our new Chapter Development Director. So John has over 20 years of experience and it has a wide range of information technology a wide range in a wide range of information technology as a software developer, a software test engineer, uh, and a help desk supervisor, Navy information system technician, and his current role as a cybersecurity engineer. He has an AS in information system programming, a BS in uh, information technology, and he's a graduate with a, a master's in information te technology management uh, in cybersecurity in June of 2020. Just two classes left. <laughs> two classes. You're almost there. <laughs> He's a fellow for the Cybersecurity Skills Journal at the National Cyberwatch Center, a member for the ISSA and OWASP chapter board member. He holds several industry certifications, including the CompTIA uh, CSP Plus. Uh, he's currently preparing to take the IC Square CSSP certification to uh, further his goals in becoming a CISO. John is also a technical mentor for the two for two Cyber Patriot, Cyber Patriot teams, a lead player ambassador for the National Cyber League, and now he's the new director of the student chief, the uh, director of the, of the student chapter development uh, for the National Cybersecurity Student Association. Uh, he's also uh, currently working on a pilot uh, project with the Girl Scouts of America Cyber Program that will debut in 2020. Uh, so at this time, I'm going to hand it over uh, to to John. Uh, John McGill. All right, great. Um, thanks for the great intro. I mean, that's a that's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> you don't really realize, you know, uh, how it all kind of piles up because uh, you just kind of keep on volunteering where you know there's a there's a spot open, and uh, you know it it all kind of adds up after a while. But um, yeah, I'm really excited to be the um, director of chapter development now for NCSA, and um, that between that and uh, my involvement with the National Cyber League. Uh, I, I stay pretty busy these days, but, um, you know, of course, both of those are under kind of the same umbrella. So it's a really great, uh, you know, opportunity to represent both communities. Um, so, yeah, this uh, talk that I'm uh, getting ready to go over uh, was uh, first presented at 3CS, uh, which is um, October this year. It's going to be in Dayton, Ohio. Um, and uh, last year it was uh, down in Louisiana. And uh, that was a, a really great opportunity for me. I uh, really enjoyed speaking at that. And uh, afterwards, I had several people approach me, about, uh, you know, wanting additional information and, uh, you know, kind of uh, some Q&A. So uh, we want to go ahead and leave some time for that at the end of this. Uh, for right now, I'm going to go through the presentation. And uh, if you want to put your questions in the chat box, I will answer them as soon as the presentation is over. And uh, we'll just kind of do a little Q and A session afterwards. Um, so this uh, this was originally written to target uh, universities that did not have a cybersecurity club or had a very junior cybersecurity club, and uh, that's still kind of the audience uh, for this. Um, uh, however, I feel like there's a lot of good information in this uh, for current cybersecurity chapters, and so and, and definitely you know as uh, director for chapter development, I feel like this is all very pertinent information to how to develop a chapter or, you know, enhance your cybersecurity club by adding the NCSA component to it. Um, we're currently, you know, going through and, uh, you know, coming through some applications uh, for NCSA. And uh, if you're new to this, this uh, broadcast, then that's kind of uh, all done through the web uh, portal. So if you want to go to that web portal and kind of move around, it's uh, uh, the cybersecurity uh, uh, NCSA site. And uh, from there, you'll be able to see all the chapters. Uh, you'll be able to apply as a chapter or get uh, additional information if you already are a chapter. Um, so yeah, without any further ado, I think I'm gonna just go ahead and jump in the presentation. And then uh, looks like we have uh, half a dozen people on so far. Um, so if this broadcast, if you miss the beginning of it, or if uh, you wanna share it out, uh, approximately two hours, maybe a little bit longer uh, after the presentation. This is going to be recorded and then it'll be uh, made live so that you can review it again or share it with people who weren't able to, to appear or, you know, someone joins us late, they can always go back and, and watch this part. So, um, yeah, I'll go ahead and get uh, started uh, with the presentation. All 
All right, so if everything's going right, then you should see my presentation uh, up on the, the sl slide share. Is that, does that look pretty good, Gus? Yeah, looks great. Okay, great. So um, yeah, National Cybersecurity Student Association, here is the, um, you know, at the bottom of the right-hand corner, you'll see the cyberstudents.org. That's the website that I referenced before for the NCSA. And um, yeah, uh, so uh, the, title of this presentation was called Rolling with the Tide. And this is because I came from Tidewater Community College and our very first year as a cybersecurity organization, we, we were not even a club yet. And we decided that we were going to pick a nautical theme and we uh, appointed, you know, uh, captains and, uh, you know, we had uh, uh, deck hands and everything. And uh, we kept it all very fun and whimsical and very uh, nautical themed. Uh, so I gave you the inspiration for this. Um, so uh, this was done at Tidewater Community College in Virginia Beach. And that's where my experience draws from is uh, building up the cyber club uh, from scratch uh, all the way up to, you know, the first year that I, uh, I was the president um, for two consecutive terms. And that kind of gave me some of the experience that I draw on uh, for this presentation. So um, as Gus mentioned, I, I have a, a Navy, ba uh, Navy background. I came from uh, the trenches, so to speak, you know, uh, I uh, uh, was part of the information insurance workshop, uh, uh, workshop in on my ship. And there I kind of learned some cyber skills and kind of chased that for several years in the Navy and realized that that's what I really wanted to do. So I went ahead and transitioned out. And that's uh, when I got a job as a cybersecurity engineer, where I currently work, um, work on big simulators. It's a lot of fun. Uh, um, and then, you know, as far as my education, we went through that, um, that that one at the very bottom, the masters, that's the one I'm really uh, excited about. I've got two classes left, like I mentioned, and uh, um, actually this is finals week for me, so I'm uh, <laughs> a little bit frazzled, but we're, we're getting there one step at a time. Um, so, yeah. Um, all right, so our objectives here again, you know, uh, I really wanna motivate people to build their own cybersecurity clubs. And I think that the cybersecurity club is so important because you have this, education, you know, uh, which is filtered and it's got, uh, you know, all the necessary objectives to be, uh, for example, like NSA, if you're trying to be the, uh, the center of academic excellence, um, or if you have like a, a building curriculum, but it doesn't allow for a lot of experimentation and it certainly doesn't allow for a lot of networking or, you know, um, uh, career building per se. Um, you, you definitely learn the skills, but you don't necessarily have the, the ability to apply them all that much. And uh, for me, that was definitely the case when I got out of the military. Uh, the very first uh, uh, competition I went to was one that was run by a, a local uh, college, and they uh, had GE's Ghost Red team out, and they did a, a capture the flag there. And uh, I mean, I had no connection to anybody sitting in that room, and I, um, I had to form a team on the fly. Uh, so we picked four people, put them all together. I felt like I was probably you know, a little bit ahead. I already had my bachelor's degree and I had a whole bunch of certifications and everything. And uh, I was working with a lot of people on my team that, you know, they were in the middle of their bachelor's program. So I, I got to admit, I was a little bit cocky uh, walking into that. And uh, after one hour, I still hadn't submitted a single point. After two hours, one member of our team just got up and walked away. <laughs> Never an explanation, just walked away. Um, after the... Uh, uh, they, they did a small break and they did a demo. And when the demo was done, the other two just cut out and they said, uh, we've got homework to do. And so now I was down to just myself on this team. And um, so my goal at that point was just to keep the placing that we had, which was not last, right? I mean, that was, that was really my only goal at that point was don't make me come in last. I, I just uh, got to walk away from here with some, some dignity, right? Um, and yeah, it was, it was a wake up call and, uh, you know, a little bit of, you know, humbling. Um, I nearly completely walked away from competitions, uh, you know, because I, I was so frustrated that I really had no application of all these skills that I thought I had. And um, yeah, so I, I went back and I doubled down on classes, uh, uh, but then I kind of realized that I was between this, this rock and a hard place and that, you know, my rock was the classes I were taking was a little, they were, they're not super challenging for me. Um, I was learning some stuff, but it just didn't seem to really have the traction I needed to, to like get a job with it. And um, the, then the hard place, of course, you know, was, you know, my obvious lack of ability to do things in competition when the pressure's on. And, you know, so I, um, you know, I, 
I started to reach out and find other resources at that point. And that's when I ran across a faculty uh, and that was at Tidewater Community College. And he wanted really to, to start this, this uh, cybersecurity club so that we could participate in the Virginia Cyber Cup, which is um, an annual event uh, up at uh, Virginia Military Institute. Um, it's a fantastic event. And you know, I, I was really excited about that. Um, so we kind of organized this ad hoc meeting of people uh, that were interested in doing this competition. And uh, we all kind of looked at our skills and kind of talked about who was you know, better at what. And um, we had a broad range of, of people at, that were there, everyone from finance and programming. Some had no experience at all. Um, we had some project managers and uh, people from um, you know, the, the finance industry that had come in. Um, most of us had not even seen a CTF before. We had one or two that did. And uh, so we kind of got together and we decided, okay, well, we've got to have someone in charge. Right, and um, so we elected, uh, we had a little miniature election and we came up with the, that's when we came up with the, the different positions of like, uh, you know, the captain was going to be a, a you know, a nautical captain. <laughs> so it was kind of fun, um, but really we, we had no idea of becoming an actual formal club to the school at this point. Um, and so, you know, it was a, quite an eye-opener when I realized that, you know, there was a ton of hoops to jump through to actually become a club. Uh, you had to meet with, uh, you know, uh, the, the Student Government Association, draft a charter, do all of these, you know, um, uh, you had to have a bank account set up. And, you know, it was, it was a lot of work to kind of try to become a club. And so wasn't really sure if that's what we want to do or we just want to do, you know, this, this ad hoc, you know, meeting kind of group. Um, so we, we ran as kind of an informal group for a while while we were working on our charter and our constitution and writing all the bylaws and everything. And uh, we were using National Cyber League at the time to kind of train for the, uh, the NCL. Uh, uh, sorry, we were <laughs> to, to train for the Cyber Cup. Um, and, you know, that was a really great experience because they have a, a gym where you can kind of walk your way through it slow and, uh, you know, that we use the gym, I think, almost as much as the competition to kind of train for that. So it was a really great experience for us. And, um, you know, the uh, the event itself, of course, wasn't free. So, you know, that was actually somewhat of a, a good thing for us because, you know, we uh, when, once you pay, you're actually kind of invested. And if you're invested, then you feel like you want to get your value out of it. So um, we all took it pretty seriously. And, uh, you know, we did very well uh, for our first year. And that's when we decided, you know what, this is this is in our blood now. We love these competitions. We love this opportunity, you know, to just be under that, that timeline and that pressure and be able to, you know, uh, work together as a team and come up with answers and pool our resources and our talents. And we decided, you know, this is something we want to do on a regular basis. So in our first year, we went to all kinds of different colleges. We went to their local events. Um, we had uh, uh, several CTFs that were just hosted you know, at, at um, you know, a couple hours away or whatever. So we had traveled to those and, you know, we, we made our focus on these competitions. And um, yeah, so I, uh, let's see. During the, uh, like I said, uh, during the comp competition, we did really well um, uh, for, we, this was a community college and I don't think we were expected to do nearly as well as we did. We came in fourth, uh, which is uh, against some amazing teams. So, you know, uh, we, we really, really loved you know, that experience. And um, so we went back to Tidewater Community College and we said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna actually form a club. And um, so to do, uh, to, to, to create a club, of course, you're gonna need students, you're gonna need faculty, and then you may even need sponsors, right? And um, that's a kind of the three people that, or sorry, three um, roles that I'm in, uh, addressing right now with this uh, presentation is, you know, if you're a student, hopefully you'll be uh, motivated to create a cybersecurity club. If you're a faculty, you'll want to get involved and you'll want to try to help students form this club and, uh, you know, get their, their uh, experience. And then uh, sponsors, if you're out there, we're always looking for sponsors, you know, um, to help these clubs. And um, I, I especially, you know, I, I think that there, there's an easier way to do that that I didn't know. And that was, uh, you know, uh, creating a chapter organization through NCSA, WESIS. Um, I think uh, ISSA has one. Um, 
you know, there's uh, ACL, I think has one, you know, there's, there's a lot of different, or ACM, uh, they all have these chapter organizations that you can start. And um, so the NCSA actually has like a little starter kit that they send out and it has, you know, uh, some meeting minutes, templates, and it's got, you know, a, a general idea of how to start, you know, the, uh, the constitution and, you know, uh, create the bylaws and everything. So it's a, you know, really kind of a, a head start, you know, and uh, so, you know, if you are looking at that cybersecurity, you know, club from ground zero, it doesn't hurt to, you know, get a, get a little bit of a template to work off of. Um, okay, so I, uh, let's see. Yeah, so our, our club went on, we ended up getting some guest speakers, which, which were fantastic. Um, got a little bit of funding from the college. We uh, got our name out there a little bit. And, you know, the uh, students, I think, you know, they, they created this network uh, that we still have today, even though we've all gone our separate ways, we all know each other much better than if we were just sitting in a classroom together. And um, I, I really think that that's a key part, because cybersecurity, I, I feel, is a very small field still. Uh, and I run into people all the time that know somebody that I know or, you know, that I've, uh, that I serve in certain groups or whatever with. It's a, it's kind of a, a small community. So um, the following tips uh, came out of the first year that I, I, I weathered through this, you know, um, new cybersecurity organization. And uh, so the first one is before you uh, start to row, make sure that everyone's on board. And what I really mean by that is that too often we have this idea of what we want to do, but it may not be the same as what everyone else wants to do. Um, for example, uh, we were looking at possibly doing a job fair, and we were also looking at possibly creating our own CTF and hosting that so other colleges would come to our campus. And we also wanted to practice, you know, for the National Cyber League and place well there. We also wanted to you know, uh, go to the Virginia Cyber Cup, and we, we had so many different things that we wanted to do that you just don't have the resources and the time uh, to do all of those, right? So you really have to boil this down and get down to, you know, what are the expectations and, and have very clear purpose. Um, and this is what I usually kind of talk to people about, you know, I, uh, the, the, the key here is not to worry so much about what the result is, but worry more about what the needs are of the group. Um, you know, what are their dreams? What, you know, if you focus on their dreams and make them come true, then that kind of uh, will bring them back uh, over and over again. And, uh, you know, so um, the, the key here is to build these like on ramps, right? Uh, where, you know, you have these opportunities for leadership and development. You have these uh, abilities to take on, you know, a small project and be successful with it. Um, you have these abilities, uh, you know, that kind of, you have these opportunities to bring people out of, their shell, and that's kind of difficult, you know, um, especially in some of the, the college age uh, kids that are, you know, just just you know starting college. You know, they're they're not really ready to just jump in and volunteer to lead the entire organization. Um, a lot of time, what I'll see is about an 80-20 rule, right, where about 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. And um, by creating these on ramps, you know, uh, you create these opportunities for the other 80%, which I think is really important. Um, to maintaining the health of a cybersecurity organization, because if you can't get people uh, retained, then you know you're you're going to be looking at the same five or six faces in the room all the time, and it comes becomes kind of like this little echo chamber, you know. Um, so it's uh, really really great to have new new students come in all the time, and to do that, you've really got to create these these on ramps. Um, a big thing about you know this this idea about making sure that everyone's on board um my faculty actually called it a battle rhythm right and that's the that's a military term i guess you know for uh like the order of uh business uh, you you do the same the same thing over and over again you, you create this repeatable process you pl uh, plug everyone into that process and then you're able to you know um develop kind of a a consistency which uh uh, brings people back over and over again because they know what to expect, you know. Um, and then uh, another kind of note about that is, you know, uh, it's called the John Cusack rule. And uh, that's a, uh, John Cusack, I guess, has this rule that, you know, his his set is free of fear. In other words, everyone is able to talk about anything that, you know, criticize anybody or, you know, uh, offer, you know, obviously, hopefully, construction, uh, constructive feedback, right? Um, but, you know, everyone has the ability to use their voice and, you know, everyone has the ability to 
you know, finds um, uh, a, a, a place to air out their ideas. So um, I really think that John Cusack rule is a big part of keeping everyone on board and not just some. If you allow someone to, someone to always just take the stage, then you always are just gonna hear what they have to say. And what you're gonna see is a lot of people start filtering out of the organization. Um, they, they may show up three or four times and then they just disappear. Um, you know, they're either facing that fear, right? Um, uh, they don't feel like, or, or, or they don't have an on-ramp, like I mentioned before, to, to where they feel like they can participate. Um, so uh, that kind of leads me into my next uh, slide, which is that you can't push a rope, right? Um, so it's really difficult sometimes in a, a volunteer organization to get people to volunteer. Um, they may just show up and a lot of times, you know, they'll kind of lurk in the background. Um, but you really can't push people to do something, right? Especially volunteers. You push on a volunteer and they just disappear again. You know, you're, you, um, uh, there's nothing requiring them to be there. So really you, you've got to entice them to be there. You've got to be able to, you've got to be there to show them you know, um, all the opportunities that are available for them and kind of lead them, right? Pull them. Um, this brings back to this, this, this old, old adage that, you know, managers push and leaders pull, right? Um, I, I definitely have learned a lot uh, of how to pull people, right? Um, working side by side with them, uh, not taking all the, the glory for myself, you know, but also not taking all the work for myself. You know, a leader that works side by side uh, with, uh, you know, especially junior and, and new members, it makes them kind of feel welcome. And uh, uh, the additional uh, benefit is that the leader will develop in the person that is pulling, right? <laughs> so um, let's see, uh, a big part of that, of course, you know, is, is always giving credit away to the team members and always, um, you know, kind of uh, recognizing when, when the team excels. Um, you know, you, you can, you can have all the evidence in the world that this is the way we need to do something. And you, you can't convince people that that's the way to do it. It's, um, you have to understand, you know, what their needs are and what, what their perception is. So, um, big part of that is listening and, you know, just, uh, you know, it's a, it's very different to run a cybersecurity club on a campus because, you know, generally these are student run organizations. So it's students leading students rather than faculty leading students. That kind of breaks the paradigm that they're used to in that, you know, the, uh, the professor usually puts out the, the plan and everyone follows the plan. Well, that, this disrupts that idea by putting a student in charge of another student. And a lot of the time we don't have the leadership uh, skills built in yet. So um, uh, working alongside uh, of other people, I think really kind of helps develop these leaders. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of that also has to do with, um, you know, uh, like I mentioned before, those, those on-ramps, you know. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of assigning a mentor or having a person, um, you, know, uh, you know, a brand new person that comes to the organization just automatically assigning them a mentor. I'm not a big fan of that. I'm also not a big fan of, you know, asking people for help. You know, um, I, I try to organically grow to where people, you create the opportunity and someone will fill that opportunity. So, um, yeah, okay. So, uh, next slide is that you can't navigate out of fog by standing still. Um, sometimes I call this analysis paralysis, right? Um, this is where you debate something endlessly and nothing ever gets decided. Um, you'll often see this in a cybersecurity club uh, with students that don't have a lot of leadership uh, uh, experience because you know it's it's difficult to make a decision that affects other people uh that's a that's a leadership skill right and um so there's different ways to kind of approach this and different leadership styles that i feel work really well in cybersecurity clubs um the first one is like a democratic model where everyone has this big open space for their discussion and their opinions and they encourage each other to be creative and uh they encourage each other's ideas right um, that's a really great idea of a democracy um, where everyone has this, this equal voice. Um, it builds the commitment because uh, it, it, everyone agrees on what needs to be done. And, um, but the, the problem with every democracy is that you have this underrepresented you know, minority, right? So if six out of 10 people say, this is what we're doing, there's gonna be four people that are not too happy with that, right? Um, 
So, you know, democratic has its, its own kind of challenges to it. Um, you know, part of that also is that, you know, the decision making process gets slowed down quite a bit. Uh, it takes a long time to reach a decision in a democracy because everyone has to agree or, you know, the minority voice is suppressed. So, um, you know, it, it just takes a lot longer to come to a decision. Um, so out of that, we kind of have this oligarchical mo model, right? And the oligarchical model is, you know, ruling by a very small few, you know, uh, it's, uh, you, you have a core group of um, leadership. And this is what most clubs end up kind of floating into where you have a president, a secretary, and a vice president, and they, they're the leadership council. They're the ones who are going to, you know, make the decision for everybody. They'll take inputs from anyone and they'll have, you know, a, a time to discuss things, but ultimately they're the ones making the decisions. And, you know, the, the, it, it works really well, especially with volunteers, because it gives them uh, the ability to focus on single tasks because the oligarchy says, okay, this is what needs to be done and you're the one to do it. So, you know, um, it gives like individual tasking works really well in an oligarchical model. Um, let's see, uh, it does free up a lot of time for people to focus on their lives outside of the club. Um, sometimes when you overcommit, you have this work-life balance issue where you have uh, people that will, uh, you know, what I call flame out, right? They, they show up, they volunteer for everything, and then they just disappear. <laughs> you have to retask everything. So you really have to watch, you know, that flame out um, when you're, you're uh, assigning tasks to people, make sure that they don't um, take on more than what they can handle. Um, you know, build on success is kind of where I go with that, uh, where you, you know, give a small task and then your reward is a larger task, right? Um, okay, so uh, let's see. It does it tend to make a, a very conservative decisions. In other words, change does not happen very fast in an oligarchical model. Um, it does have a low turnover, which is really good because, um, you know, your leaders, leadership council, they have a, a very large commitment to the organization and they typically will, will, will keep those positions for a long period of time. They also kind of can get a little bit selective about who they want in that leadership council. And so it can create these silos where, you know, um, you have the same people that are constantly being promoted from within and it, that can actually create kind of a little bit of separation with some of the, uh, less outgoing students um, that, you know, they, they need to feel like they have ownership also. And if they, uh, it, it also can create a um, perception of favoritism, um, especially if there's not a minority voice that's represented. Uh, so oligarchical can be very, uh, it, it can devolve into like a, a, what they used to call a good boys club, right? Or a good old boys club or whatever, you know, where you have this, um, you know, the, the same people that are always doing the, the, the same stuff and everyone else. If you want to be a part of the organization, you're going to do what they say. And that, that's a kind of a negative part of this oligarchical model. But like I said, I, I think that a lot of clubs kind of start out this way. And uh, so I, the, the idea here is to, you know, get everyone on board and kind of start pushing in the same direction. And um, so, you know, as this knowledge and expertise get more focused and it's kind of hard for them to break in, um, you might have to actually break that up as like a faculty or something, um, you know, or if you're a leader in the, the, the group, you have to be very aware of, you know, people that feel marginalized or feel like they might be on the outside or, you know, are having a hard time breaking in um, and create opportunities for them. So, you know, I, one sure way to kind of, you know, uh, get rid of this is to have this, uh, you know, have, have term limits on the positions. Um, However, there is kind of a side effect that if you get rid of the people that are doing all the work, then nothing ever gets done. So it's a, be careful about being intrusive in your organizations because um, it, can, it can have a reverse effect of, you know, a chilling effect where nothing ever gets decided now. Um, okay, so the next one would be uh, leadership by default. Um, this one is almost like a kind of a, a chaotic model where Everyone decides what they want to do and, uh, you know, what their involvement level is going to be. It does work somewhat good for, you know, volunteer organizations. Um, the regular leadership uh, gets turned over quite a bit. And so you don't get that entrenchment. 
Um, and then when members want to participate, it's not really perceived as, oh, I'm taking over or I'm kicking you out or I'm taking your place. You know, it's more of just a, hey, I want to be in charge of this now, you know, and so you'll have a lot of little subcommittees that are all in charge of different things. Um, I actually kind of like this idea of um, subcommittees and uh, because it builds those on ramps, you know, for students to be able to um, uh, have have uh, uh, ownership in the organization. And it also, um, uh, like I said before, it decreases that entrenchment. Okay, so um, next one gets a lot of press right now. It's called servant leadership. And uh, as individuals kind of interact with others, um, their aim is not to gain power, but to gain authority. And um, it's all about kind of promoting the well-being of those uh, around him or her, right? Um, the, the, you get a lot of loyalty in a, in a servant, you know, uh, model because you feel like everyone is here to help me. And it, it really kind of builds a very loyal, strong, strong group. Um, they're usually focused a lot on like uh, reputation and uh, involvement in the community. Um, it's very supportive of like diverse opinions and perspectives. Um, and one of the things I really like about the servant leadership model is that you don't have to shout to be heard. There's always an opportunity to speak and not have that immediate judgment um, or kind of feel like, uh, or, 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 or a perception that you're being pushy because you're, you're really just trying to help somebody else, right? And so it kind of eliminates that filter. Um, it's really difficult in this kind of a model to make a, a quick decision. Um, and it takes a long time to build, especially when it comes to reputation. So in community colleges, for example, servant leadership might not be very practical because you have such a high turnover of students that, you know, um, they're usually there for a couple of years at most. And, um, so you don't really get that, that time to build the reputation. Um, so servant leadership may not work in a community college, may be more geared for like a four-year college. Um, so, you know, kind of be aware of that when you're, you're selecting, you know, a leadership model to follow. Um, then there's the transformational uh, leadership model. Um, this provides a role model, and then uh, it, it models what high ethical behavior looks like. Um, it really supports long-term vision very well. Um, and this may be the model to adopt if there's problems in your organization. Um, if there's bad blood or if there's, you know, a, a history of, you know, um, negativity, uh, transformational where you, you take an individual and you, you model what that high ethical behavior looks like, it reinstates that idea of fairness back into the organization and, um, you know, helps people uh, build creativity and kind of grow the organization. Um, if you're looking at a uh, problem within your cybersecurity organization where it's shrinking and you don't know why, um, putting a transformational leader in there uh, to, to model good ethical behavior may eliminate some of the problems that you don't see happening. Um, it's built on this, this empathy idea, right? Um, and uh, building up employees. <clears throat> One of the problems with transformational leadership is, of course, you know, that it's intrusive in that you have to promote a person that you think would be good in that role to, to model that ethical behavior. Um, so it's very non-democratic in that, in that way. Um, and uh, it takes a lot of time and money to kind of build leaders in this kind of a, a model. So, um, you know, with, if, you, if you have limited funding and uh, limited time to work one-on-one -on -one with individuals, uh, transformational leadership is going to take a little bit too long and it's not going to really be able to turn your organization ver around quickly enough. Um, so really all of these different leadership models I've talked about, you're going to find some blend, right? You're going to find, you know, some middle ground where, okay, we're using servant leadership here and, you know, we're going to, uh, uh, you know, have this oligarchy, you know, um, to kind of, you know, leadership council, so to speak. Um, you know, you're going to kind of pick and choose what works really good for your, your organization. And um, this is really when the faculty has to be paying attention to, you know, what, what is going on inside the club and be able to suggest or, you know, um, move people toward a different leadership role um, or a leadership model. So um, 
yeah. Uh, okay, so that <laughs> that's a very long slide, but um, I'm going to move into the next one, which is um, called rolling with the tide and not against it. So what this really kind of comes down to is why are people here? Why do people volunteer? Why do people show up every week? Well, there's been a lot of studies on this and it kind of uh, comes back to people want to feel needed. They want to give back to the community. They want to share skills and, uh, you know, pay, possibly fulfill like a uh, spiritual need or obligation. Um, they want to have a change of pace, get to know the community better, um, help other people. And uh, the last one is make new friends. Or sorry, that's not the last one. Sorry, make new friends. Um, they also want to explore new careers uh, or explore advocacy. Um, donate their time. Uh, some people are there to fulfill a mandate or a requirement. Um, but really just this idea to do something outside of yourself. Uh, some people do this to set an example for their children, uh, learn a new skill or act on a passion that they're feeling. Um, so there's, there's all these reasons that people come, uh, you know, to the organization. And being aware of what drives people is key to getting them to come back. Because if they are there for you know, to learn new skills and they are, you know, all they keep on uh, seeing is that, you know, everyone around them can do everything better than them and they don't have an opportunity to put their hands on something and actually learn, then they're probably just going to leave the organization, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So, <clears throat> pardon me for just a second. Okay, so, um, according to a study by uh, Volunteer Toronto, um, they, they said that 93% of volunteers um, do so to make a contribution to the community. That really tells us everything we need to know is they are there to contribute. And if we don't give them an opportunity to contribute, then that's going to be our number one reason why they don't come back week after week. Um, okay, so I, that's, that's a pretty much everything was rolling with the tide. So once you get that, you know, um, what, once you find out why people are there, then that's what you accentuate, right? So if I, everyone is there, you know, if, if you take a survey and most people are there um, to meet new people, and th then that's the way you drive your organization. Because if you, if you, you know, try to drive it toward competition and you're, you don't have a competition driven group, then people are just going to disappear. So um, I always kind of recommend that you put a survey out, you know, why are you here? What, what do you expect to, you know, to get out of this, uh, this organization? And that helps you kind of tailor a little bit to, you know, what the activities of the organization will be. And again, that goes back to our faculty because faculty is the, the anchor, so to speak, right? They're the ones who are going to be there from year to year to year, um, you know, when the students change constantly. So. All right, so next slide is to build a boat from both ends. Um, looks like I'm dropping frames here. Hopefully, can you see that okay? Yeah, you're fine. Okay, good. Um, all right, I got a warning that I was dropping frames. So, <laughs> all right, so uh, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, to build a boat from both ends, right? Um, if, you're, if you're building a bridge, for example, and you start on the bank, uh, on either bank, and you start building the bridge toward each other, you're going to miss each other completely, right? Um, and that's kind of how these, the, yeah, the, that's kind of how um, some cyber clubs work, where you have the faculty that wants to drive the, the competition, uh, sorry, drive the club in one direction, and then you have the president that has a completely different vision. If that's not aligned, then they're never going to meet in the middle. Um, so really, the idea here is to build on the back of the youngest, uh, newest members and build the skills that you have into your team, not in yourself. Um, this, you know, you have to have a strong mast on this deck, right? Um, for the first wind that comes along, it'll just tear it right out. That mast is usually your, your president um, or, you know, um, your strong leadership example. So um, surround that mast with like really strong supporters. And you're, you're now you're kind of building this ship, you know, from the uh, keel up and, uh, you know, everyone is, is kind of, you know, resting on the, the strong leadership and the backbone of the organization. Um, so uh, really, I guess, <laughs> not to belabor the, the, the example too much here, um, you know, make sure that everyone has an activity to do. Everyone 
has a part of the ship that's their own. You know, the cybersecurity club is made up of every member of it, not just a few. Um, and again, I gotta emphasize here not to mentor or create buddies or sponsors or anything like that. Um, instead, sit down and do a profile and an interview with them. Um, when you have this uh, mentor or buddy or sponsor, um, it works really well if you have like an extroverted person that you know is looking to you know make friends. That's not going to be everyone that walks into the door. And if uh, they walk in and you're like, hey, here's your buddy, and uh, here's your sponsor packet, and uh, you know here's a copy of our bylaws then they're probably going to evaporate, right? You're never gonna see them again. So um, I, I kind of caution against these mentor uh, or buddy programs. Um, you know, just uh, invite people to, you know, participate as they feel comfortable and create these, these opportunities for them to do so. All right, so the next slide is um, the captain's place is at the wheel, not in the quarters. Um, you, get, you really have to respect everyone's time. and. This is what really a volunteer organization is all about. People are not giving money per se, they're giving their time. And um, so you, you need to respect that time, right? And one of the, some of the, the distractors of that are when you get a person that hijacks talent, right? Um, uh, or, you know, you, you really have to be able to minimize the distractions and uh, get everyone to, to focus on, uh, you know, the, the larger picture. Um, Another big, big part of uh, the captain's place, you know, being at the wheel is that you address issues, small issues before they get larger. Um, you know, if you're down in your quarters and you're not paying attention to what's going on, then you're not gonna see, you know, the conflicts that are starting and they're gonna get worse. And then by the time that they come to your attention, it's gonna be so so difficult to fix them that, you know, um, you, you might end up, you know, waiting a semester to reinstitute the, uh, you know, to reinstitute the cyber club. Um, let's see, I, keeping the ship float going in the right direction, right? Uh, the, the, re, the way we do that is by constantly appreciating people, giving them, you know, just saying thank you, right? I mean, we don't pay volunteers um, with money. We pay them with thank yous. And, you know, we, we appreciate people when they do something. We celebrate their minor victories. You know, we are constantly, you know, uh, practicing active listening, mentoring, uh, creating these public dialogues, uh, valuation, um, and, you know, giving time for this reflection. Um, you know, team members should know what to do and how to do it, um, you know, with, with the support of, you know, the captain coming in and kind of, you know, uh, providing either, you know, help or resources, either one. So a big part of, you know, being at the wheel is providing resources. Um, you're not going to know everything. And uh, so, you know, being able to provide answers to people is, is a big part of that. Um, all right. Next one is um, you can't put out to sea without getting a little wet. And what I mean about the, uh, uh, that is adaptability, right? Um, it's a lot of work. People are you know, especially volunteers are unreliable at times, so you just kind of disappear. Um, I talked a little bit about, you know, flame out before, there's also burnout. And burnout is when, you know, they just feel like they're doing everything and they're constantly, you know, uh, they're so busy that they, they start neglecting other parts of their life, especially their school curriculum. If their grades start to slide, they're gonna be gone, right? So you really have to <clears throat> pay attention to that and be adaptable. You know, if you had a big event planned and you just don't have the support for it, you got to be able to just cancel the event. Uh, you have to be very, very aware that these are volunteers, these are students, they have a work-life balance that is very delicate at times, um, and, you know, be able to, um, you know, scale back or scale up when the students want more, right? Um, and a good example of this is uh, our first year, we weren't really sure if we wanted to run the cyber club during the summer. And uh, the building is going to be open. We have, you know, some summer classes, uh, but a lot of people were taking internships or they were, you know, graduating out and we had three or four people show up. So rather than, you know, in uh, uh, continuing on with the cyber club, we decided what we were going to do was um, just pull it back. And, you know, we're just going to suspend it for, you know, during the summer and, you know, do projects uh, to build up the infrastructure and, you know, build new labs and stuff. Uh, so there was still things to do for people, but really we just kind of put a suspend on the cyber club itself uh, to, you know, uh, focus more on what, what we could do with what we had. 
So um, you may find that also like halfway through the year that your membership just dwindles, um, especially around finals time. Um, you know, just be able to be adaptable to that. The next one is your first mate is your replacement. And, um, you know, I really, really like this uh, model where, you know, uh, we rotate positions all the time um, and we're constantly recruiting for the cyber club and constantly recruiting for, you know, new, new blood, so to speak. Um, you know, a, a big part of this is to intentionally include newcomers in the leadership. Um, and then, you know, so they, they may come in as, you know, um, uh, I've seen this happen actually quite a bit where, you know, the, their very first meeting, they show up and it's the election night and they run for president. And that's great. You don't want to discourage that, you know, and maybe they don't get elected president. So your job then is to say, hey, I recognize that, you know, this, this, uh, you know, student um, wants to be part of something bigger. They want to give, you know, uh, of their time and their talents. And, you know, so if we can't make you president here, then maybe what we'll do is we'll put you in, in as like a co president or, a, you know, a, a, a vice president and train you up a little bit and then move you into the president position. And, you know, um, this idea of constantly training your replacement is great because, you know, uh, especially with a high turnover of like a community college, uh, because if they're going to be there for two semesters, then you can spend one semester training and then they move into the next position up and it keeps the, the flow the same. It keeps the consistency of the club together. And so I really like this idea of, you know, um, you know, uh, there's, there's a, a quote that says, our real problem then is not our strength today. It is rather the vital necessity of action today to ensure our strength tomorrow. And I, I find that to be very true, you know, that if we're not thinking about, you know, okay, who's going to be in charge next year, you know, um, that when we get to next year, we, we have a complete reversal of direction of, uh, you know, the, the vision uh, changes, the leadership changes, the, you know, what everyone wants to do changes, and you get this really kind of disruptive environment. And then you get these, these people that were part of last year, and they're like, wait, wait, this isn't what our club is about. You know, and you create this this conflict. Um, so I, I definitely believe that you know keeping a long term vision um, has to do with you know constantly training the replacements that are coming up. Um, next slide here is uh, split the treasure evenly. Um, you know, and you know I, I want to bring up an example that can, that happened with uh, my cyber club the very first year um, that ties back a little bit to when a person you know, for example, runs for president. Um, we had uh, two of us run for president and we got about equal votes. And rather than just saying, well, th I'm gonna be the president, you know, I, I kind of had a flash of inspiration. I'm like, well, why don't we be co-presidents? You know, uh, I've got a lot going on this, this uh, year and you know, you obviously have a lot going on, but together, you know, we could, we could captain this. So, you know, being able to create, you know, uh, opportunities you know, by splitting the position or, you know, uh, you know, having, you know, what, what I really liked about that was, you know, that uh, we created this um, opportunity for diversity uh, by being a champion of opportunity, right? Um, so it's not necessarily just about, you know, putting, intentionally including diversity, but if you create enough opportunity, then diversity follows that. So um, really, I, I, I kind of think that that's the, the key to getting, you know, a lot of um, uh, diverse leadership is to create enough opportunities that, you know, it's always there. Um, letting others lead is a hard challenge for me because I, I like leading <laughs> and, you know, um, I like taking ownership of things and seeing the, overseeing the development of things. So it's really hard sometimes for me to, to make room for other people to lead. And uh, that in itself is a skill, a leadership skill that you, you'll learn, you know, and uh, you, you have to learn that sometimes the hard way. But as a faculty, you can see that happening and kind of, um, you know, say, hey, um, I know you're really active and I really appreciate that. Why don't we create some, some room for other people? I, uh, I, I've had that happen to me a few times. I had a great mentor when I was uh, still back you know, getting my bachelor's degree and uh, you know he said John you raise your hand all the time and I really love that except for you're 
you're taking all of the spotlight and I, I don't have the ability to bring other people into the discussion, you know? So um, I had to learn to kind of sit back a little bit and, and let some other people have a voice, um, you know, so that's kind of a, a key to, you know, splitting the treasure evenly, right? Um, the other thing of course is, you know, I, to, to celebrate, right? I mean, uh, you know, have parties, have, you know, um, an election party, have a, a mid, you know, term party, uh, you know, create just these, these opportunities where people really want to come back and, and, you know, you've got to kind of put fun into the club sometimes, you know, because it gets very competitive and you get like focused on a single task, you know, um, so, you know, try to, try to have some fun activities planned that don't have to do with, you know, uh, cybersecurity even, you know, just uh, some, some uh, team building type exercises. Um, again, that comes down to breaking that 80-20 rule, right? We don't want 80% of our work to be done by 20% of the people. We want to, you know, kind of spread that out to where everyone has a piece of the pie. Uh, next slide is uh, to know where the ship is uh, going before you leave port. Um, you got to be able to connect the uh, group to the larger vision. And one way I found that is very, very effective th at this is cross-pollination, right? Take your club to another club, you know, um, take your club to an ISC square meeting, take your club to an ISSA meeting, you know, let them see what works other places. And uh, it kind of challenges those assumptions of what, what a club is. Um, and how a club operates. Uh, you know, the cross-pollination I think is, is really key also, you know, with community colleges, working with those, uh, you know, four-year colleges that have, you know, uh, agreements, you know, with, um, you know, to uh, articulation agreements uh, to where the credits transfer across, you know, it's, it's good for the health of the student to be able to make allies in these other organizations, you know, that are, um, uh, you know, to, to provide them a path you know, when they finish up at your community college. Um, let's see, uh, there's four basic assumptions that uh, go along with, uh, you know, just uh, in general uh, with uh, clubs. And that's that everyone knows what the club is. Everyone knows their role. Everyone knows where to get the information and everyone gives and gets feedback. And these assumptions are disastrous. Um, you know, not everyone knows what they're supposed to be doing. Not everyone knows how to find out what they're supposed to be doing. Um, you know, and, and not everyone's connected to that larger vision of what the club actually is, what they actually do. Um, I find that one way to do that is as soon as your lecture officers read through the bylaws, read the mission statement out loud for everyone to hear so that everyone knows what the club is about and you know, you'll be able to connect them to that larger vision. And then just making sure that everyone gets the opportunity to both give and uh, get feedback. So, um, that's my presentation. Um, here's uh, some shameless self-promotion. Uh, my Twitter handle actually has changed. It's at Mako McGill now, uh, M-A-K-O-M-C-G-I-L-L. And LinkedIn is still good on that. And that's uh, still a decent email to get a hold of me. So if you have questions, uh, I know that we're running, you know, 54 after now. So yeah, <laughs> um, we're not gonna have too much time to answer questions, but um, I wanna go ahead and turn that over now uh, to you know, anyone that's in the audience that wants to, you know, ask a question, just put it in the chat box. So I had a question, uh, John, real quick. Uh, what's the best way for uh, student chapters to bring, to lure in uh, uh, pr pr uh, prospective students, uh, you know, to join the chapter uh, with their, for chapter meetings? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Um, I think that part of that is uh, to make the faculty aware of the, the that there is a cybersecurity club, right? Um, a lot of the time it's the faculty that are going to know their students and be able to say, you know, um, I see you're really, really interested in this. Did you know that we have a cybersecurity club? Um, so you've really got to get the rest of the faculty, not just the faculty sponsor, but let the rest of the faculty know, you know, about the meetings and, uh, you know, kind of encourage them to, you know, uh, look for those students that are looking for more. Um, and other than that, uh, you know, having a very strong social media presence, of course, is, is very helpful in this day and age. Um, we, that was kind of a struggle for our club uh, to get that, get, get a basic web page up and running and, uh, you know, be able to promote out on all of the different platforms. Um, I think it's really a, a good idea to include a social media, you know, uh, position in your cabinet 
of leaders. So just to add to that too, uh, you know, I contacted my dean and and told her about our cybersecurity club and asked her if, if she could email um, a flyer that we had to all the students in our program, which is the information security program and the networking program and the, you know, uh, these other program, uh, uh, this program degree too. And she sent an email to all those students, uh, which, uh, and they all got the email about our club meetings too. So that was another way I helped to uh, disseminate the information about our clubs. That's a great idea. We also have like uh, some monitors around our uh, campus that uh, show like regular events that are happening and getting, you know, kind of just a slide up there can help, um, you know, and then I mean, if you have to put flyers on the door, right? <laughs> yeah, go old yeah. school. <laughs> so what we did too is uh, on when I, in my associate's degree at community college, I I was also on student student government too. So student government handles all the bulletins, boards, on all our four campuses, and we had like I don't know sixty thousand students between four campuses. So I was I went to the um, student government. And I said, hey, you know, we're having this event, and I gave them a flyer, and then they posted all their flyers and all their um, bulletin boards on all the campuses. So that was another way to help, uh, you know, disseminate that uh, information about our club. That's really good. Um, Cecil actually asked a really good question here, which is, uh, what is a typical approach to reaching out for local sponsors? Um, so yeah, we actually do a little bit of sponsorship in NCSA. Uh, we have uh, a um, really nice flyer that's been printed out that talks about like different sponsorship levels and what you get for those levels. Uh, one of the keys to approaching sponsors is to, you know, not go with your hand out, right? You know, you're not, you're not out there asking, you know, for, for money. You're, you're, you're providing value, you know, uh, give them an idea of what they're getting for their money. You know, um, another big thing with uh, sponsors is, you know, the maturity of the organization obviously matters. Uh, if you, you know, um, are looking for someone just for a weekly, you know, hey, I want you to pick up the food for the club or whatever. Um, you know, they, they're going to want to see that, you know, it's a, it's, it's something that, you know, people are going to come to every week, you know, because they don't want to waste their money any more than, you know, you want to waste their money, right? So, um, you know, being able to provide value for their money, I think that's the biggest thing is, uh, you know, what do they get out of it? What's the return on investment here? And uh, have, have a flyer kind of pre-made about uh, if you, come in at the $500 level, we will, you know, put your slide up at the beginning of every single one of our meetings, or, you know, uh, if we're running an event, you know, we'll, we'll let you have a table right in front, or, you know, we'll provide you um, resumes from our group, you know, there's always something that you can provide value for, but to just go hat in hand and, you know, ask people, you know, to, to give money, um, I don't find that that's very effective. So um, I said, next uh, question here is from Jared. It says, uh, what do you think about a survey to measure student interest and recruit potential members? What should that include? That's a really good question um, about what to include on it. I, I like the idea of uh, sending out a survey and you know, getting a measurement of that, that interest. Um, I think that you have to kind of uh, narrow that down a little bit, or you're going to get a, a wide range of answers. Um, so you might uh, put it on a, you know, kind of a easy to fill out survey where on a scale of one to five, how important is community involvement? How important is cyber competitions? How important is uh, guest speakers? How, uh, how important is networking? Um, you know, kind of look at the reasons again, uh, like I said before, why people come, you know, what, why do people volunteer? Uh, you know, and, and focus on that. Um, so that gives you a couple of things to start with. Uh, uh, let's see. Next quick question. Is, wait, yeah, quick yeah. question and follow up to that. So, um, uh, you know, when I started with my student chapter too, we would send out surveys for availability and when can students meet? Uh, how did you um, tackle that with your student chapter? Did you have on-campus meetings? Did you have meetings online? Yeah. Um, so we actually kind of had a, a rough start, um, you know, trying to find a time where everyone could get together. And at some point you just have to make the decision and say, you know what, this is our availability. Friday nights, we're going to get together, uh, you know, and this is when the, uh, you know, the building is available and, you know, when we're able to meet. Um, one thing that actually kind of helps with that is uh, like a lot of uh, schools will have, a ISC squared or an ISSA that meets on their campus um, and just uses the rooms. Um, if you can 
work with that group and uh, you know try to try to figure out like uh, if you could come in before their group or after their group, then uh, you already have kind of a captive audience, right? Um, so they get the the value of attending like the ISSA meeting, and then you also have a student meeting that's right after it, and um, you know that kind of piggybacking off of you know uh, uh, someone else's start, so to speak. Um, but yeah, I, I I don't know. We tried to do it democratically and and find a time that worked for everybody, and we just couldn't do it. At some point, you just have to you know kind of make a decision and stick with it. And another thing to add to that too, uh, what I try to do is I kind of we did a like hybrid meeting. So we had students meet on the campus, and the students who weren't able to make it to the campus, we would just set up a webcam, and we would put that webcam on the you know on their uh, on the projector screen, and they will we'll be able to see them, and they'll be able to see what we're doing, and that's how we included them in our meetings if they couldn't make it to the campus. I really like that approach. Um, we actually did that with an ISSA chapter out here where they were able to kind of broadcast the meeting on uh, like a Zoom bridge, like what we're on right now. Um, it's, it's surprising though, but we don't actually get very many people that dial into that. Um, there's uh, a lot of time it just seems like, uh, you know, people want to come and <laughs> be around other people, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good. I mean, I mean, I mean, you're right. Um, and then we use Google Hangouts. Google Hangouts is free. You can do that also, but it, you know, at least you, you know, we put the option out and said, hey, you can meet, mm -hmm. uh, you could, you could tune in via online, so there won't be a no excuse for them not to show up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a question on Cyber Patriot here uh, uh, from V Heath. It says, I, I'm looking into starting a Cyber Patriot in uh, my area this year. What advice can you give me from your experiences with it? So Cyber Patriot is a great program, high school, you know, uh, kind of targeted um, and you know, it focuses completely on the defensive side, right? Um, now within the Cyber Patriot uh, uh, program, you have coaches, but you also have technical mentors. And technical mentors could be anybody that, you know, feels like they want to, you know, contribute to uh, the Cyber Patriot team. And so uh, there is an ability to go through that, that Cyber Patriot uh, uh, web portal when you first register your teams and request that, you know, you get a team mentor. And the team mentor may have more experience already in Cyber Patriot than you do. And I think that's a really good way to, to create a, a program from the ground up. Uh, let's see. From Jared, I see, um, I'm starting a club that's geared toward connecting on campus and online students. Indiana University has a strong online program. Uh, in our bylaws, I wrote that at least one officer has to be online. That's that's fantastic. I love that. That's that. I talked about adaptability before and, you know, um, being able to bring in the online community, uh, you know, that's, that's going to be really effective in some colleges, especially, you know, um, where you, like, for example, I, I am currently on a global campus program now. And, you know, we tried to do the National Cyber League and um, I couldn't get enough interest, uh, you know, just from the couple classes that I'm in because we don't meet face to face. We don't have a club. We don't have, you know, that kind of interaction. And uh, so I just would put it out there in the bulletin boards and say, hey, I'm trying to start a team. And I, I didn't get any traction at all with that. So I love the idea of, you know, um, being able to kind of knit those two, you know, the online community and online students, you know, with the, the ground-based, uh, you know, that's, that's fantastic. Um, so we're gonna, so uh, John, we're uh, uh, coming up on 804. Oh, my hard stop here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but uh, don't worry everyone. Our next, uh, so we're gonna have open office hours on, let's see, uh, February 18th at 8 p.m. Eastern. So this is gonna be an open session where uh, you can ask us questions about anything like we're talking about right now. I'll be on, uh, my boss, Casey O'Brien, uh, the uh, director of, and principal investigator for the National Cyberwall Center. He'll be on too. He's been in the field for 20 years and been from and pet testing all the way to IT governance, running programs, uh, big IT staffs, enterprise. So he'll be on there too. I don't know if John will be available for that uh, to, to jump on uh, uh, or not, but um, the February uh, 18th at 8 p.m. Eastern uh, and uh, be on a lookout for email. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining this webcast series and, and John for his great presentation on how to build an effective cybersecurity club. Yeah, I'd like to add to that also my thanks, uh, you know, for uh, listening to me ramble for 45 minutes. Um, you know, I could go on and on about this and uh, I certainly don't mind, uh, you know, helping people start, you know, chapters or uh, start you know, uh, new clubs. Uh, feel free to reach out on, uh, to me 
you know, on social media or, you know, just uh, email me, you know, uh, I, you know, I'll, I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can, but I, I love to, to, you know, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about, you know, the importance of these clubs and, uh, you know, uh, being able to develop them. So I, I don't mind asking, answering questions at all. Well, thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you the next webcast.